Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce Ed Lee, who is here. Uh, he's a professor at Chicago Kent Law School, uh, where he directs the uh, internet. I'm sorry, the internet law program. Is that right? Intellectual property. Inle intellectual property <laughs> program. Um, and Ed used to be here at Stanford. He was a legal writing uh, fellow, and he also worked closely with the Center for Internet and Society, and had a a very large part in our Golan case from the very beginning, back many, many years ago. And uh, so we're very happy to have him back. And today he's going to talk about the uh, grassroots uh, movement to stop the uh, SOPA last year and his work exploring that movement and the protests and how that is uh, a form of popular constitutionalism. So welcome, Ed. Thanks for coming. Great. So thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Julie, uh, for that introduction, and thank you to the Center for Internet and Society here, uh, and thank you all for coming to take time out of your busy schedules, I'm sure, to hear a little bit more about my book project that I'm currently working on. Now, I want to begin uh, with a st story that I'm sure that most of you in the room are familiar with. It's a story about a silversmith in colonial America who made a famous ride on April 18th, 1775. And of course, that ride uh, has become uh, really popular and the subject of legends. It started out uh, in Charlestown, Massachusetts, and made its way up to Lexington, some 13 miles away, taking approximately two hours. And as I said, this this ride has become uh, well famous, uh, for instance, one if I land, two if I see, uh, the British are coming, the British are coming, etc. As the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote, so through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm. A cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. In 1994, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian, David Hackett Fisher, wrote this excellent book about Paul Revere's ride. In the book, Fisher debunks some of the myths about Paul Revere's ride that night. Writes Fisher, this romantic idea, speaking of the, the notion of a solitary rider at midnight, is etched indelibly upon national memory but it is not what actually happened that night. Many other riders helped Paul Revere to carry the alarm. Going further in the book, Fisher describes how Paul Revere and the other midnight riders were able to carry out the alarm through a decentralized network. As Fisher writes, it was coordinated, coordinated through an open disorderly network of congresses and committees, but had no central authority. It enlisted its churches and ministers, its physicians and lawyers, its family networks and voluntary associations, uh, many of which they had known beforehand. Now I want to take some liberties and describe this network as a Revere style network. To go back to Fisher's words, it was a bottom up network, one that mobilized people quickly, at least quickly for the time period. The Midnight Riders tapped into local groups and communities, as well as institutions that they had pre-existing relationships with. And from that point on, people were able to sound the alarm and mobilize the resistance to the incoming British troops. And this gave an important first victory to the young America uh, at the Battle of Lexington and Concord. OK, so fast forward to November 16th of last year. We're back in Massachusetts, this time on the western side of Massachusetts, where four internet activists, Tiffany Chang, Holmes Wilson, Nick Revel, and Dean Jansen, come together to form a new nonprofit called Fight for the Future. And this, the primary mission of this new nonprofit is to sound the alarm about SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act sort of the latest and greatest of Congress's efforts to combat piracy and counterfeiting online. The, the bill was 
touted as a bill that would target so-called rogue websites, both foreign and domestic. And the primary uh, provisions uh, were twofold. Excuse me, twofold. First of all, a, and this is the most controversial provision, it was a domain name blocking provision that authorized the Attorney General to seek a court order, whether it be a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction or an injunction against a foreign website accused of criminal piracy or criminal counterfeiting, and thereafter to get that order and then serve it on service providers and search engines in the United States to cut off that domain name from its IP address. So I liken this process to basically having your phone number disconnected. Nobody could call you. If, a, if with a domain name, nobody could find the domain name if it was not attached to its IP address. The second main provision of SOPA was what I'll characterize as a notice and shutdown provision, similar to the same idea of the notice and takedown provision of the DMCA safe harbors. So under this notice and take uh, shutdown provision, it would go against, copyright holders could go against payment providers like PayPal or ad services like Google AdSense and then serve them with a notice alleging a site was engaged in piracy or counterfeiting and thereafter the services would have to shut down their services to the alleged rogue site in order to, to maintain a safe harbor or immunity from copyright infringement lawsuit. Now, as you can tell based on the, the copyright enforcement and also trademark enforcement provisions just outlined, this had a huge support from the various uh, copyright industries, media conglomerates, as well as big uh, trademark holders. So you see from uh, this visual depiction, the usual cast of characters supporting the copyright bill are here. There are IAA, MPAA, movie studios, music studios, uh, media conglomerates. Uh, but because of the counterfeiting provisions, you also have a group like Pharma, uh, as well as GM and other audio man manufacturers who supported uh, the bill. And uh, because the bill was touted as a job-saving bill, because piracy uh, sort of takes away American jobs, the, the labor union AFL-CIO joined in support of this SOPA bill. 241 lobbyists for the entertainment industry alone uh, were working on behalf uh, of the bill to get its passage. And uh, $91 million was spent just by November 16th, the date of the first hearing in the House Judiciary Committee for SOPA. And you can bet that m many more millions were spent after that date since there was a lot more activity in December. 32 co-sponsors of SOPA were in the House. And not to be outdone, there was a Senate version of this bill called PIPA. Uh, it had uh, 42 co-sponsors for that bill. Uh, and just note that co-sponsors are not just supporters of the bill, these are the members of Congress who want their names associated with the bill and who will argue you know, uh, strongly on, on, the, on its behalf. The numbers show a strong bipartisan support and I think it's pretty fair to say that when the bill was first introduced in November of uh, last year, SOPA was a slam dunk to get passed. And the House was trying to move quickly to get its passage uh, given all the support from the various industries that wanted to see it enacted. But something amazing happened uh, in two short months. What was a slam dunk turned out to be something that was derailed. And that brings us back to uh, November 16th uh, of the last year. Uh, and we're almost at the one year anniversary of that day, so it's quite fortuitous to have this talk today. On November 16th of last year, there was a day of action uh, and this is a day of action that maybe some of you are not as familiar with compared to the dramatic Wikipedia blackout of January 18th of this year. But this was really one of the key moments in the opposition to SOPA, uh, led by Fight for the Future, uh, as well as Stanford Law School's own Elizabeth Stark, uh, who taught here last year, who got an assist from Jesse Dillon, uh, Bob Dillon's son, uh, decided to host this meeting uh, at Mozilla down in Mountain View uh, to get different groups like internet groups like uh, EFF, uh, tech companies, uh, Representative Zoe Lofgren from uh, Silicon Valley and some of her staff 
as well as others, to sort of discuss and plan what they could do to oppose SOPA, which seemed to be uh, a slam dunk to passage uh, in the House and also in the Senate with the Senate version. One of the key ideas to come out of this meeting was an idea to hold an American Censorship Day. And uh, if you think about that term, American Censorship Day, uh, American and censorship, you wouldn't normally associate those two words together. But that was the idea of uh, the Fight for the Future group from Massachusetts to make a bold statement about what they believe to be an infringement of speech uh, and a system of censorship created by SOPA, especially with a domain name blocking feature. American Censorship Day turned out to be a success, even though it was not widely reported by the mainstream media. 6,000 websites protested, either by blacking out their site entirely or uh, blacking out maybe their logo or some other aspect of their site as a sign of protest. And here is a visual of uh, one of the graphics that uh, the Fight for the Future group created where you can embed a piece of code in your website and this image would pop up showing the censorship of your site, uh, what could happen under SOPA. This is what they believe could happen under SOPA if it were enacted. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, well, wait a second, this seems like hyperbole. This kind of uh, image seemed quite melodramatic to me. But it turns out the federal government is actually doing something of this sort currently under an operation called Operation in Our Sites, uh, carried out under another IP enforcement uh, law that's called the Pro-IP Act of 2008, which enables the federal government to use seizures of domain names by warrants, obtaining warrants, and then carrying out civil proceedings against the domain name under civil forfeiture proceedings to obtain the uh, confiscation of the domain name, uh, using the domain name as essentially as a defendant. And this is the image that the federal government uses when it seizes uh, domain names under the operation in our site's uh, uh, initiative. And as you can see, it's actually somewhat similar to the uh, graphic that was used by Fight for the Future on American Censorship Day. Now, to go back to American Censorship Day's success, one of the key parts of the day that made it a success was that over 80,000 people called their members of Congress that day, uh, presumably to state their views or opposition to the bill. And this was something that well, was facilitated by Tumblr, the microblogging service, that in a kind of an ingenious way made it easy for their users to call their members of Congress through the internet. Uh, so that helped to generate this large volume of calls to uh, the members of Congress uh, on American Censorship Day. And it really did serve as a wake-up call to members of Congress who were not a part of the Judiciary Committee and who were not very familiar with SOPA. So for instance, Nancy Pelosi, you know, the Democratic leader, uh, tweeted the next day her opposition to SOPA saying, we need to find a better way than SOPA, don't break the internet. And don't break the internet was a meme that was used by the opposition to SOPA early on in the debate, and it was picked up by Nancy Pelosi the day after American Censorship Day. And there were complaints about SOPA coming from all sectors at this time and in the weeks following. So for instance, even though these large tech companies like Google, Facebook, eBay, Yahoo and Twitter were not a part of the blackout, technically speaking, they didn't black out their sites. They did write a letter to Congress stating their opposition to the bill on November 15th. And they said this would be bad for innovation and potentially uh, an infringement of speech. Google's chairman uh, on that same day at a talk before the Sloan School of Management at MIT actually called this censorship. Uh, and he said the solutions are draconian, speaking about SOPA. And likewise, on the same day, Brad Burnham, uh, a venture capitalist, blogged about uh, SOPA, saying this is bad for innovation. Uh, later on in December, Vint Cerf, who is the so-called father of the internet and developer of the TCP IP protocol, and, and a total of 83 internet engineers, also spoke out against SOPA calling it again censorship and even using the word American censorship here. And what the internet engineers actually, uh, I think were very helpful in contributing to the debate, uh, they pointed out that domain name blocking 
uh, was inconsistent with the new protocol being developed to make the internet more secure from cyber attacks, the so-called DNSSEC protocol. So by having the government authorize the cutting of uh, domain names from IP addresses uh, was making it more incompatible with the development of this new cyber secure protocol that was or, uh, you know, already being developed uh, currently. Now Stanford Law School's own uh, Mark Lemley and 110 law professors also uh, came out with a letter on March, uh, excuse me, on, uh, on uh, October 15th, um, excuse me, November 15th, uh, against this bill, and they called it a threat to the freedom of expression. Uh, and in that letter, they said that this may represent the biggest threat to the internet in its history. Now these sort of very vocal complaints, vigorous complaints from all sectors and various different experts very, I would say, prominent experts as well, uh, were voiced uh, right around this American Censorship Day period and the weeks following. Did that stop SOPA from proceeding forward? Well, I think you would guess uh, the answer is no. Uh, uh, the sponsors of SOPA continued to march forward with this bill, and I think they pr wanted to proceed even more quickly given the mobilization of opposition to the bill. Uh, instead of wanting to slow things down, they wanted to speed up the pace because it looked like there was more vocal opposition that was mobilizing, so it's better to get this through uh, when they could. Now, I, I should note, uh, just in the point of uh, sort of fairness to the sponsor of the bill, uh, Representative Lamar Smith of Texas, he did come out with some amendments to the bill to try to narrow the scope of it and deal with some of these complaints uh, issued by um, these various experts and uh, interest groups. So in a manager's amendment in December, he proposed uh, various uh, narrowing amendments to sort of reduce the scope of uh, what websites might be um, susceptible to a notice under SOPA. But by and large, the two main provisions that I talked about, domain name blocking and notice and shutdown, uh, were still intact. Although the notice and shutdown under the manager's amendment now required a court to get involved instead of a direct notice from a copyright owner uh, to a uh, payment or ad service provider. So with the House moving forward with SOPA, uh, that brings us to the dramatic protest of January 18th, 2012. And this is the one that I'm, I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with, uh, having seen uh, what Wikipedia did that day. And I would say that this protest was every bit as dramatic as that midnight ride of Paul Revere. On January 18th, 2012, we had, for instance, Wikipedia, for the first time ever, deciding to take a political stand through its website by a blackout. And just to, to spend a, a few seconds about how this process was uh, decided, Wikipedia is run essentially by all of its volunteer authors who contribute time to sort of create these uh, entries or articles uh, related to the online encyclopedia that they offer around the world. Uh, they had a period of notice and comment, so to speak, and uh, the vote was pretty overwhelmingly in favor. And the vote was around the world from writers around the world. The vote was pretty overwhelmingly in favor of staging a, a blackout to SOPA, and a blackout not just in the United States, but a blackout globally to all English language pages of Wikipedia, which are quite you know, uh, significant in number. In addition, uh, Google also joined the protest. Uh, uh, Google, for the first time, sort of blacked out its logo, its iconic logo. And then there were a number of other heavily trafficked websites, including, for instance, Reddit, Mozilla, Craigslist. Yeah, I'll just go through some of these uh, really uh, sort of arresting images. Wired Magazine and uh, WordPress and WordPress blogs. They all blacked out their site. And there are many other smaller uh, sites that engaged in the protest as well through either a full blackout of their site um, or just a partial blackout of their site in some respect. Now, to go back to my earlier example of Paul Revere, I'd like to be, call this network that was form to uh, protest SOPA, a Revere-style network. It was one uh, that instead of having horses, though, they had websites. And those websites were able to mobilize people from the bottom up. 
and mobilize those people quickly. So over 115,000 websites joined this dramatic uh, online blackout on January 18th, which, if you compare it with the American Censorship Day, 6,000 on November 16th, uh, here, you know, you have an incredible increase on January 18th. And of course, the two largest uh, participants of the blackout were Wikipedia and Google and their community of users who uh, trafficked their sites on that day. Now, one thing that I want to underscore, this blackout was a protest, but it was not just a protest because the purpose of the blackout was to get the people who visited the sites or the users the community, for instance, of people who use Wikipedia to actually do something, to show their opposition to uh, SOPA, to Congress. So this was a call to action, uh, and I borrowed the, a nice image that Elaine, Elaine prepared for uh, this talk. So this, this showing the call to action, this was a call to action to people to do something, to get involved in the process. So millions of people actually voiced their opposition on that day and the day following. Eight million people who used Wikipedia that day looked up the contact information of their members of Congress. So Wikipedia created this incredible feature where in a short amount of time, like a, a day and a half or so, they created this feature where you can insert your zip code and then have the members of Congress in your zip code area pop up and the contact information given back to you. So eight million people utilized that function on that day, which shows a high level of interest in this bill. In addition, 10 million people signed various petitions against SOPA, including a petition organized by Google. There were 3 million emails sent to Congress that day, uh, as well as over 100,000 phone calls to Congress. And that sort of fulfilled the, the instruction or advice given by Representative Lofgren, who was advising the opposition uh, on the most effective way to uh, oppose the bill would be to melt the phone lines in Congress. That's the quickest way to get the Congress members' attention is to call them and to voice your opinion if you're a constituent in their district, to call them and to voice your opposition to the bill or whatever bill it is. And with over 100,000, that's a pretty significant number. On that very same day of January 18th of this year, uh, many of the sponsors did a 180-degree about-face. They turned from sponsors to opposers of the bill. So in the House, nine of the co-sponsors dropped out. And there's a little bit of a graphic to show you. Uh, more of them that remained sponsors were Democrats than Republicans. Uh, and here, the total is 23 at the, at the day of uh, the blackout on January 18th. And many more members who were not sponsors voiced their opposition as well to the bill. In the Senate, 10 senators who were sponsors dropped out as well and voiced their opposition. One of them, for instance, is Marco Rubio, a senator from Florida, you know, one of the rising stars of uh, the, the Republican Party. He wrote on his Facebook page, and one thing to note, by the way, is that the use of social media in these campaigns, you know, Pelosi on Twitter, uh, Rubio on Facebook, that's very significant, I think, in terms of how uh, the debate is being waged in this uh, controversy. So Rubio comes out uh, with his statement that uh, basically we should take more time to address the concerns raised by all sides uh, and come up with new legislation that addresses internet piracy while protecting the free and open access to the internet. And free and open internet is one of the central slogans or rallying cries of the opposition. And I'll talk about this more in a, in a few minutes how free and open internet relates to free speech. Now, the day after, I think we can get a good indication of how toxic SOPA had become, because there was a Republican presidential debate hosted by CNN in which somebody tweeted in a question about SOPA. So by and large, the debates have avoided questions about copyright law, but it took somebody watching uh, the debate or anticipating the debate to send in the question through Twitter and here's what happened.
speech and movement of, and information across the internet, it would have a potentially depressing impact on one of the fastest growing industries in America, which, which is the internet and all those, those uh, industries connected to it. At the same time, we care very deeply about intellectual content that's going across the internet. And if we can find a way to very narrowly, through our current laws, go after those people who are pirating, particularly those from offshore, we'll do that. But a very broad law, which gives the government the power to start stepping into the internet and saying, who can pass what to who? I think that's a mistake. And so I say, no, I'm standing for freedom. OK, so I think you can see from the video clip First of all, the audience reaction to SOPA just by the asking of the question uh, by John King, that they were already skeptical of his, the way that he was formulating the question. And then Gingrich and Romney's responses were great. I mean, they were, you know, they were politically astute, so they knew what the answer should be, especially after the January 18th blackout you know, made this SOPA bill toxic. So that, I think this video nicely shows just the mood uh, at that time on January 19th. Uh, as to the possibility of uh, enacting SOPA. It was not, it was sort of dead on arrival at this point uh, of the debate. So the day after uh, this presidential debate, SOPA was shelved in the House. Representative Smith said it was indefinitely uh, tabled, and the, the Senate version, Senator Leahy tabled as well. Uh, PIPA was tabled in the Senate. Now I think um, one of the important questions that uh, that we should ask is, well, why did these protests occur, and why were they so successful? Uh, copyright laws and bills have never really attracted this sort of public attention and public scrutiny. But this was a first time, and it was so dramatic, and it was actually successful in stopping what appeared to be a slam dunk uh, when it was first introduced. The first theory to explain what happened uh, is the theory that basically millions of people were misinformed that if only the people read the bill and realized what was really going on with SOPA, they would not have opposed it, and maybe they would have even supported it, but they would not have protested it in the way that they did. So here, for instance, is Senator Leahy speaking to NPR in Vermont the day after the Wikipedia blackout. And that same sentiment was expressed by Stephanie Moore, the Democratic Chief Counsel for the House Judiciary Committee, who at the American Constitutional Society uh, meeting, sort of ironically enough, uh, said this about uh, what happened in the debate. Netizens did poison the well, and netizens referring to sort of internet people who are really uh, steeped in uh, internet. Netizens did poison the well. There's certainly a feeling on Capitol Hill that the internet response was orchestrated by misinformation. Now, it turns out this kind of uh, view is reminiscent of a debate that occurred dating back to the framing of our country. So to, to go back to James Madison in 1792, he wrote this essay about who are the best keepers of the people's liberty. And Madison spoke in a faux debate with two sides. The first side was the anti-Republican or the Federalist. And basically, the Federalist said, the people are stupid, suspicious, licentious. They cannot safely trust themselves. They should think of nothing but obedience, leaving the care of their liberties to their wiser rulers. And through various points in, in our history, we've seen this sentiment come up. So for instance, in the passage of the Notorious Sedition Act, which made it illegal to maliciously criticize the president or the federal government, uh, Representative Otis of Massachusetts said this, the most unusual attempts were made to deceive the people and alarm their fears, that they were threatened with the deprivation of a darling privilege, meaning he was referring to the freedom of the press. And the Sedition Act was actually passed, but then it was two years later, it was repealed. So that's one theory that can explain what happened, that millions of people were misinformed about the law, and if they only understood, they wouldn't have protested. 
A second theory, and the one that I will support, and uh, support is the view that I think is probably the better understanding of what happened, is a theory of popular constitutionalism. And I hope there's a receptive audience here today because uh, the former dean of this law school, Professor uh, Larry Kramer, is one of the chief uh, advocates for this constitutional school of thought. And in, in a book called The People Themselves, which I commend to all of you to read, he lays out the case how in history, uh, the notion that uh, the Supreme Court is the, sort of has the supreme and last word on a constitutional matter uh, was foreign to the framers and to, for many years afterwards, that judicial supremacy is a modern invention and something you know, relatively recent. And I don't have time to do justice to his book, uh, but in a nutshell, uh, the point is of popular constitutionalism that the people's view of the Constitution reigns supreme. To go back to Madison in his debate, the Republican view would espouse this. Uh, the people themselves are the best protectors of their liberty. The sacred trust can be nowhere so safe as in the hands most interested in preserving it. Now my view is that popular constitutionalism is what best explains what happened in the SOPA debate. People's view of free speech on the internet often referred to under this language of free and open internet reigned supreme. Even though there were legalistic analyses presented by leading First Amendment scholars, Floyd Abrams and Lawrence Tribe, both saying that SOPA was a violation of the First Amendment, said Tribe, or not a violation, said Abrams, that legalistic analysis did not carry the debate, in my view, nor did close analysis of Supreme Court precedent and parsing out, well, do we need intermediate scrutiny applied to SOPA or strict scrutiny applied to SOPA? That really wasn't the test used in the popular debate about SOPA. Instead, the debate used the people's scrutiny. That was the test. And under that test, SOPA flunked. Now, we only need to turn back to uh, the, our framing of our Constitution and a lesson from uh, the British monarchy before our country to understand how this dynamic works in terms of speech and technologies. So to go back to the reign of Henry VIII and around 1538, he started a regime of control over printing presses, you know, the revolutionary technology of the day back then, uh, by imposing strict limits on what could be printed. You needed a license to, to actually print something up who could print, who was entitled to print, and how many presses a, a printer could own. It was limited at one point to just two per authorized printer. And the printing acts also authorized the stationer's company, which was a guild that the crown chartered to control printing in England. They had the power to, this warrantless seizure power, to seize unauthorized presses and unauthorized books. And uh, to borrow, Professor, uh, the late Professor uh, Patterson's words, the stationers were the policemen of the press. And I should add, they were the private policemen. They weren't government officials. They did this on their own. Now, the, thankfully, the Printing Acts expired at some point in 1692 for various reasons. But one of the reasons why the Printing Acts expired and this regime of restrictions on the printing press was that there was a popular movement in England in the 16th and 17th centuries for a freedom of the press. So that's the meaning, original meaning of the freedom of the press. It's the freedom of the printing press. And that's a, a concept of that, of course, carried over to the framing of our Constitution and Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights eventually codified the freedom of the press as one of the protections or rights in the First Amendment. And I believe the debate today about a free and open internet uh, is something that's very similar. It's a, it's a popular movement to recognize a protection related to a speech technology, here, the internet. It's not defined by courts, at least not yet, but it's being defined by people. So to borrow the words of Reddit's general manager, Eric Martin, he said it was a fight started by activists, but it was not a fight won by activists. It was won by individuals, by communities, by companies like Reddit, which was never political about anything. And that's a similar comment 
that Wikipedia said. They were never political about anything, but they felt so threatened by this law or this proposed law, this bill, that they thought they needed to make a stand. So taking a stand and saying this would affect me. So for example, who are these people who, who made a difference? Take for instance uh, Jeff Rodman, who works here in, in uh, the Bay Area. He's a founder of a video collaboration site. He is the person who tweeted Nancy Pelosi to ask her, what is your position on SOPA? Uh, where do you stand on internet censoring and SOPA? And uh, Pelosi, to his surprise, he said he wasn't expecting a response, but Nancy Pelosi responded to his uh, tweet on November uh, 17th, the day after the American Censorship Day. Or take as another example, 20-year-old college student Ryan Virchie, uh, who's at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He said he was never political in his life, but he read about SOPA and he read the bill after reading about SOPA and the controversy, and he thought this was a bad bill that would cause censorship. So what does he do? He was aware that the White House had established this petition process where anybody in the United States can uh, write the White House to petition them to ask the White House to answer a question. And his question was about uh, SOPA, and uh, he wanted to know what the, the White House position was and if they were against it. And he, he said this because he was you know, so disturbed by the law that he wanted to take this straight to the top. Uh, and he posted this on the White House uh, website. He put a link to it on Reddit. And within one day, he got 8,000 signatures on the White House petition. And in, within two weeks, he got 30,000 signatures. And total, he got over 50,000 signatures. So that guaranteed the White House would have to respond. And then there was a similar petition from somebody else who asked the president to veto SOPA that also received over 50,000 signatures. So over 100,000 people out there who are interested in this actually did something and petitioned the White House to respond. And their petition uh, sort of helped push the White House, which had remained on the sidelines until January, to take a position. And their position was, does anybody know their position? Their position was against SOPA. Many of the concerns raised by the interest groups and the people uh, in various sectors uh, were confirmed or picked up by the White House. So here in a very strongly worded passage, so for instance, any effort to combat online piracy must guard against the risk of online censorship. And the White House goes on to note about the importance of the openness of the internet. Those are recurring themes that the opponents of SOPA continually brought up throughout this debate. So obviously, the people were you know, instrumental in helping to evolve, uh, helping to defeat the bills and the money in Congress supporting the bills. And in addition, this is something that maybe some of you are not familiar with, the opponents of SOPA made it a re-election issue for members of Congress. So uh, this is a kind of curious event. Uh, Paul Ryan, you know, the nominee, uh, for our vice president by uh, Mitt Romney. He was one of the first targets of this opposition, uh, even though he had not staked out a position to SOPA yet. Uh, but he became a target of the opponents of SOPA, at least some of the opponents of SOPA, who wanted to know his position. And sort of wisely, uh, he came out, soon came out with his position, which was against SOPA. So he said the internet is great for the freedom of expression, and SOPA could create uh, undue regulation, censorship, and legal abuse. The conservative blog Red State and Eric Erickson also made an effort to oppose the, uh, the candidacies or re-election of any person in Congress supporting SOPA by donating money to their opponents. So for instance, Representative Blackburn became one of his targets, and she eventually changed her position from being a sponsor to an opponent of SOPA, I think after the January 18th blackout. Now one final way in which people made a difference in this debate is people made SOPA a consumer issue. And here's an interesting example how the community of people on Reddit, there's, there's sometimes the users are called Redditors. The Redditors organized a boycott of the domain name re registrar GoDaddy. Uh, and because GoDaddy came out in support of SOPA. Uh, in this boycott, within a few days, over 70,000 domain names were transferred from GoDaddy to another site. 
So you might guess what GoDaddy did afterwards. Right? GoDaddy, what, changed its position about SOPA. They came out against SOPA. So it's, it's a pretty effective way uh, shown throughout by the opposition, uh, which really, as I said before, was unprecedented. It really had never happened before. Now, what happens next? So we, we know a little bit about the debate and how the bill was defeated, but what, where do we go from here? Well, one of the results of the debate is that the internet nonprofits who are actively involved in internet policy have mobilized together to be more uh, vigilant about sounding the alarm about bad pieces of legislation or bad treaties or other bad actions that might harm the internet. So they've created this Internet Defense League shown by this website graphic here, and they will sound the alarm by showing this cat signal instead of a bat signal to sound the alarm about uh, potentially threatening, threatening pieces of legislation. And this is one of the projects by Fight for the Future, uh, in part, is a sponsor of. Even more, I think, uh, dramatic and exciting is that uh, some of the most vocal opponents of SOPA, Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon and Representative Daryl Issa of uh, California have proposed, in conjunction with uh, internet nonprofits, the establishment of an internet bill of rights. And they've posted this on their website, keepthewebopen.org, if you want to find out more information about this. And if you look at the two of the first rights guaranteed under this Bill of Rights. They deal with a free and uncensored internet and an open and unobstructed internet. And those, again, I think come directly from the debate about SOPA and what SOPA uh, would allow in the views of the opposition. Now, uh, I'll be working more about what I think is happening in terms of the con this conception of speech in a book that I've uh, now titled The New Free Speech. I believe it's new in the sense that the internet is shaping people's understanding of speech and it's uh, facilitating a way in which people are able to protect that understanding of speech by utilizing the internet. And I think that was dramatically shown by the uh, various uh, events of opposition uh, in the SOPA debate where the internet was a way to mobilize people and to get them to express their views about SOPA to Congress. Now the big question that really remains, I've spoken for about 40 or so minutes, and I'm hoping to get to questions very soon, so I'm going to wrap this up soon. The, the big question that remains is what happens with courts? And we're in a law school. We study mostly court decisions in law school. Uh, and maybe we should study uh, you know, other uh, types of law, including popular constitutionalism. But by and large, our tradition is to study court decisions and what the court says about things. Now, at least in other areas, the Supreme Court has been relatively strong on the First Amendment, especially uh, as of late. There are a bunch of recent cases, uh, Snyder, Alvarez, Citizens United, you name it, that have come out on the side of the First Amendment and free speech. For copyright law, things are different. And there's, there's a sort of a copyright exceptionalism in play with uh, the Supreme Court's analysis of First Amendment challenges to copyright law. And that brings us to the Golan versus Holder case uh, that Julie referenced uh, in her introduction. This is a case that emanated out of the Center for Internet Society. So uh, you, know, you should feel proud of the work that the center has done. Uh, ironically enough, this decision came out on January 18th, the day of the Wikipedia blackout. So as the Wikipedia blackout was going on on the internet, the Supreme Court was rendering this important decision about free speech and copyright law. And here's what Justice Ginsburg said from the bench. The First Amendment likewise provides no exceptional solicitude for works in the public domain. As we held in 2003 in Cohen v. Ashcroft, copyright laws built in safeguards for free expression, the fair use doctrine, and the idea expression dichotomy generally accommodate the people's rights. So if you understand uh, Justice Ginsburg's decision, uh, she was building off the Elder decision from 2001, basically that if the copyright law has fair use and idea expression, and the law doesn't alter that, by and large, there's no need for further First Amendment scrutiny. 
So maybe we can argue that SOPA is distinguishable from the laws at play in Eldred and Golan. But if we were strictly applying Golan, it seems like it is a tough road to make the argument that uh, SOPA was a violation of free speech rights. So if we take a judicial supremacist kind of view, judicial supremacy, we could say, well, the court's view, if there's a conflict between the court's view and the people's view of the First Amendment or free speech, well, the court's view should prevail. If we take the popular constitutional view, at least some popular constitutional scholars no, it's the people's view that should prevail, and the court eventually, there, there are ways to try to get the court eventually to see the light, so to speak, uh, but I don't have time to go into those ways. Or it could be that the court's view of free speech and the people's view are essentially equal forces out there in different spheres, and when they conflict, you sort of have to work them out in some way, but there's no preordained way, court versus the people winning out in all cases. And my view, I guess, currently right now, is that this question is up for grabs. SOPA was not enacted. We did not have a First Amendment challenge to SOPA. We don't know what the courts would have said about SOPA. And given the state of uh, the law being up for grabs in this area, I think it provides both a challenge and an opportunity for us. It is a challenge in, in the sense, the same way that it was a challenge for Paul Revere on that night uh, in, on April 18, 1775. So if you care deeply about the internet, you too could be you know, one of the Paul Revere's, so to speak, or the Midnight Riders, to warn people about what you believe to be encroachments of speech or encroachment of freedom. It doesn't have to just to be speech. And I'm, I'm speaking especially to the, the law students in the room of this incredible institution. You will be the future leaders of internet policy or policies in other areas of law. So you can be a part of this debate. To borrow Professor Fisher's words from his book about Revere, you can join a common effort in the cause of freedom. But just make sure you don't cap get captured by the enemy like Paul Revere was that night. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Now uh, I want to get to uh, your comments and questions right now. But before I do, let me just mention uh, I'm working on this book and some of the key events I've chronicled on a website, thenewfreespeech.com. And it has some of the media that was involved in terms of the debate that if you're interested in this topic, uh, you know, I'll refer you to the website. And in addition, besides your comments here right now today, uh, I would welcome your comments by email at ely at kentlaw.edu. Uh, this is a work in progress, and I'm wel welcome to reaction, and I'm you know, happy to change my views uh, based on people's reaction. So without further ado, I will open it up to uh, questions and comments. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering, to, do you think this network and uh, way of responding to proposed legislation would uh, be likely to, to come to life if uh, the copyright holders try for another round of copyright extension? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, could this protest, opposition come up, the next SOPA that is proposed. <clears throat> well, they won't call it SOPA, but the next copyright legislation that is proposed. I think there's a certainly a school of thought that it would be incredibly difficult to replicate the size of the opposition that was involved in this protest. And uh, it may be that websites like Wikipedia and Google would be reluctant to go to the well too often. You know, too many times crying wolf kind of, not that I'd say it's inaccurate or illegitimate to say that there's a bad piece of legislation out there, but it, it seems like a mechanism of last resort that many of these businesses or heavily trafficked sites wanted to utilize. So I think there is some tempering of when they would use this next, but the internet nonprofits, the activists, I think they will always, and even more so, be heavily scrutinizing copyright legislation. And the Internet Defense League, for, for instance, is one. And they're also, I think, based on the, the statistics, I think there's some indication that a large, you know, a significant segment of the population, especially of those who are, I think, heavily, heavy Internet users, will be aware and follow copyright legislation that really 
never happened before. So I think that's the difference. But I think you're right to suggest, well, maybe we won't see this kind of opposition very soon, um, unless it's something, you know, SOPA on steroids, basically, even worse than SOPA. Uh, then you might have the sort of nuclear option in terms of a protest. But I think it's going to be hard to replicate. Hi. Uh, so, uh, a lot of us who were involved in the, 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 the SOPA PIPA fight saw this uh, rejection of the bills by, you know, a few million Americans as a sort of a legitimate popular force and, and m ultimately more legitimate than a law drafted, you know, in a, in a private, private sessions by industry participants and, and, and basically sort of, a, sort of a backroom deal. But what I'm wondering is from, from an academic point of view, what confers legitimacy on a particular group of uh, two, four, eight, whatever million people who happen to write uh, to, 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 to write to Congress. Since SOPA, we've seen uh, bloggers who are, uh, you know, from the uh, musician or uh, entertainment industry community or supporters of theirs trying to claim this mantle of populism, mostly by appealing to, you know, the, 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 the masses of, uh, uh, you know, blue collar employees uh, who work in the movie industry for you struggling musicians and describing them sort of with this cloak of populism uh, in the same way. So what makes a particular group of people sort of a, a legitimate political force versus just some people who are talking? Right, you've hit a great question that is a question that is debated by popular constitutional scholars uh, in depth. And ba you know, basically, the short answer is there's no easy answer. How you define, when do you reach, what, is there a critical mass that you need? What segment of the population represents the popular view of free speech or what other right under the Constitution? In this case, I guess I would argue there was representativeness shown by the numbers and the different interest groups and communities that were involved in the debate. Uh, so you had people from, for instance, business, you had people from investors, you had people from various communities, you had, uh, such as Wikipedia, you had individuals like the college student that I described, Ryan Birchie. So you have a wide variety of sectors all voicing opposition or at least criticism of this bill in a way that they, they're concerned that this is going to impact their freedom of speech on the internet. So when I, I think, in, at least in a crude sense, we can have some comfort that this view was simply not an outlandish view uh, of the freedom of speech on the internet. Uh, now, the hard part is when we're dealing with a right that is not defined by courts, and there's no court precedent on what this free speech right might be in the context of internet legislation here, it's going to be contestable, up for grabs. So you might have some opposing group say, well, you know, this is not a valid, legitimate view of speech. And you know, I think you get some of that sentiment from Senator Leahy and the staffer in Congress saying, you know, they were just misinformed, so you can't really rely upon that because they really didn't know what the bill was about. And I think you can make that argument, but I, and I would say I think they're arguing a different discourse, using a different discourse. They're arguing a legalistic discourse <laughs> Whereas the popular debate was arguing, you know, this popular discourse about freedom of the internet, and I think there are two there are two different discourses. Well, they, they didn't go that far. They didn't, I don't think they would go that far and state that. Um, I, I think they wanted to get acceptance from you know, members of Congress who are representing different constituents back home. And when those constituents voiced opposition is when people started dropping out. Uh, so the, the, the sponsors of the bill you know, did try to narrow things in some respects, but not enough. And I think the, the basic philosophy of it was counter to what many in the opposition believed in, in terms of a free and open internet. So it would, it, this bill would be the first step of authorizing, or at least one of the first steps,
of authorizing greater government policing of the internet and greater copyright policing of the internet, which is sort of antithetical or at least in tension with the free and open internet movement. Yes. Thank you. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts about um, something a little broader. You know, you've been talking about SOPA, um, about ACTA, uh, how much those two uh, interfere or interacted with each other. Uh, my background is I'm from Germany, and we obviously didn't have SOPA, but we had ACTA, and a lot of the SOPA discussions were very important for the movement in Germany and Europe all around. Um, maybe some thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, ACTA will be a part of the book, too. So thank you for bringing that question up. So ACTA is this uh, international uh, treaty that uh, some of the developed countries, like the United States and the European Union, uh, Japan, uh, and a couple developing countries agreed to. And in Europe, in starting in January, they had street protests through all throughout Europe trying to get the EU to not adopt uh, ACTA. And they succeeded. Uh, so whereas in the United States, we had internet protests in Europe, they marched on the streets. I mean, that was really impressive. Thousands of people in the cold of winter marched on the streets. And it, it does turn out there is a pretty direct connection between our SOPA debate and the ACTA debate. And um, one of them might have just been coincidence, because on January 18th is the day of the blackout Wikipedia in the United States. And a couple days later, in the reporting to, in Poland, and that was the first country where the protests occurred, the news broadcasts were describing the Wikipedia blackout. And in the course of some of those reports, segueing into a discussion of the upcoming vote about ACTA, because the, the Polish prime minister was making a decision about Poland's stance on ACTA. So the two became kind of tied, in part because maybe the proximity of events, January 18th, January 19th, 20th. The first protest in Poland occurred, I believe, on January 23rd, if I'm not mistaken. So in part because of the dates, but in part because of the similarity of the opposition fearing internet regulations that would be intrusive, even though SOPA and ACTA were different, they didn't do the same things. It was perceived as a, a similar step, an opening to have governments regulate the internet in a way that would restrict people's freedoms. So you know, I see the connection actually pretty direct, that if SOPA debate had not happened with all these protests, maybe the protests in Europe would not have been as dramatic, uh, or maybe not has been as soon. So I kind of subscribe to the chaos theory that there are different factors. And if you look at different factors, they all play a part in what happens. And if you change one little factor, you get a much different result, potentially at least. So I believe that's what could happen here. If no SOPA debate or no SOPA protest, the complexion of the ACTA debate, I think, is different. And maybe we can talk afterwards if, if your views are similar. So thank you again. Uh, expanding on that point, uh, now we have the International uh, Telecommunications Union and the World Conference in International Telecommunications Dubai, December. Um, how does this conception of uh, you know, popular constitutionalism have an influence on international law? We find it much more vague and difficult to find that pressure point like Congress, as in the case of uh, SOPA. Right, that's a great question, and, and one that um, is a major issue going forward with intellectual property law. One way to avoid public debate about an intellectual property law is to try to get a treaty first in place or an international agreement in place. And then you can just say to your country, well, we have to implement this because we've agreed to it already. Uh, it's, that is harder to fight, but there are, there are nonprofits and other stakeholders, NGOs, that are fighting that fight right now. now. I'm not sure with the, uh, the discussion that you've referenced just right now, but with the TPP in Asia uh, and also with ACTA, there were certainly NGOs and nonprofits who are heavily trying to scrutinize the, the, the treaty, even though drafts of it were secret for several years. Uh, so it, it is a challenge to, to mobilize people against international treaties. But as we saw with ACTA, it, it can happen. And the one other thing I should mention is that Zoe Lofgren has proposed an international uh, internet task force to try to sort of monitor 
that kind of thing to see sort of what happens on an international level that mo might pose a threat to internet freedoms. And right, um, yeah, these are more wish lists that are out there. Same thing with the Internet Bill of Rights. They're wish lists of what people want to see. But I, you know, as I said before, I think this is a challenge and an opportunity, right? This is up for grabs. This is something that if you're really passionate about internet policy, you know, you all will be the ones who are leading the next fight about it, uh, you know, not me. Thank you. Hi, Ed, my name is uh, Jim uh, from New Zealand. Uh, awesome talk. Um, so you. I want to, yeah, that was really great, and I'm sure you're quite tired, that's why you're drinking water. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask you, um, with regard to like mega upload and the shit going down with uh, Kim.com and everything like that, so basically you have these jurisdictional things going on, so I'll try to make it really concise, and I'm not trying to politicize it at all, but I just want your, you know, what you see. So basically the the the... The general theory is that it's basically Hollywood meeting with the Democratic Party to basically go after somebody and put it under some Title 17 type of thing because there's no internet law, which the people in this room evidently will create. Um, what do you think of that? It's basically just like some political, like game theoretical random walk that um, just... It's not a specific question, but I think you get my drift. I just want to get your opinion on the whole mega upload thing. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think this ties into um, you know some of the efforts that the United States and other countries are engaged in right now, and operation in our sites is one of them to start seizing these domain names. And I, I think, uh, in part, it is uh, strategic, and in part, it's symbolic. So. The United States wants to have some victories in this fight against piracy, so they will go after sites that they believe are facilitating a lot of uh, infringement of copyrights or uh, facilitating uh, dissemination of counterfeit goods. So they'll pick sort of the biggest fish to go after, hopefully to get a victory in that respect, <laughs> to get to get a victory in that respect, and uh, to sort of cut off the wide amount of users to that service. But also then be able to trumpet that in terms of like results to say you know we've gone after the hundred most uh, egregious infringers online and we've shut them down or we've taken their domain names et cetera or whatever, and I think you know I at least my perception of the debate in Congress is that most of the people on both sides of the debate recognize the need to combat piracy and I think the debate was about. Uh, having due process and having mechanisms in place that didn't sweep in collateral damage, to sweep in legitimate rights of websites or individual users. And I think that, at least in the United States, that was the debate about SOPA. So there was an alternative bill proposed by Senator Wyden and uh, Representative Weissen called the Open Act. Uh, it wasn't really seriously entertained, but they were hoping to use the International Trade Commission as the arbiter of deciding when to cut off money to websites. They were accused of being rogue websites. But they wouldn't, they said we should not do uh, domain name blocking as a feature. Uh, even though we want to combat piracy, let's not uh, jeopardize uh, free speech on the internet by having you know, um, wide scale shutting down of sites, some of which may be legitimate. Hello, I'm Tana. I'm from Taiwan. And uh, on the day after the goals was decided, uh, I, I read a blog about Lawrence Lessig say that the Constitution ties over. Uh, it's the day that the Supreme Court shut the door, finally and firmly, on any opportunity to meaningfully change co a copyright statute constitutionality. And when he was invited to the, green, uh, to the German, in a, when he made an address about 
to the Green Party in the German, and he, he also talked about the SOPA. And he think he thought that uh, it was not a turn, tur it doesn't tur tur turn around the table. So, because I think his view is really pessimistic compared to your popular constitutionalism, and uh, he well, he was the lawyer of the Eldridge case, so actually he's very central to this kind of uh, movement. So I, I, was, I want to know what kind of, what's your opinion about his position? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what, going back to what I said earlier, if I could, I, oh, there it is, right here. Go back earlier to the state of the law. I mean, I agree with uh, Professor Lex Lessig's characterization. One interpretation of Golan is that it does foreclose future challenges based on the First Amendment to copyright laws, except for maybe in some unusual case where uh, fair use or idea or expression was gutted or repealed or somehow you can distinguish the facts or there's a future Supreme Court. It just takes a different view of the First Amendment. I mean, that's all, always a possibility too. But if you accept that interpretation of Golan, then yes, we're sort of left with this difficult question, whose view will prevail if it came to a head? If SOPA passes and there was a First Amendment challenge, what would happen? It's possible the Supreme Court, if it reached the Supreme Court, would say this is perfectly consistent with the First Amendment. And it would be inconsistent with, I think, the millions of people who opposed the bill saying that this was a violation of uh, free speech, et cetera, whatever. That difficult question, I think there's no easy answer, sort of what's the solution, what's the right result. But in the meantime, before we get there, before we have a conflict between the court and the people's view, we can do things to make it easier to have a court accept the view that you know, you, we believe is right. And that's what I think the movement now, the opposition, is trying to build. This notion about there are some rights, this Internet Bill of Rights, that are attached to free speech on the Internet. Uh, so in the meantime, before we get any court challenge, we can change the norms of other people and eventually, you know, hopefully it filters through the courts. I think that would be the popular constitutional uh, response to sort of like the state where the court is on uh, free speech or First Amendment challenges to copyright law. Just one more. Fantastic talk. I really enjoyed this. Oh, thank you. Um, if I could offer you a third theory that sort of bridges the two that you proposed, I would look at this as the lobbyists one, and specifically the internet lobbyists one versus Hollywood, and they found a way, rather than doing decades of campaign contributions, to do it very cheaply by getting people up in arms. That does not mean to be a cynical view that people didn't understand what they were doing, which is what I hear from the first theory. I kind of reject that. Um, I don't think that all of the people writing into Congress needed to write, needed to read all of the bill to understand what they were supporting and what they were opposing. Um, so the question of how do you have something that's a genuine movement for, or not, I think you can shape it but not fake it, right? You can, you can help get people engaged and motivated and informed, but it's very difficult to get them to act against their core values, which is perhaps why the response has failed from Hollywood of let's get small content creators together to try to oppose this. Um, it's hard to get people to jump on that when they look at that bandwagon and say, but these are the people who are doing what's in their economic interest, mm -hmm. right? There's not that sort of purity um, that comes along with it. So I'll just offer that as a third possibility that really what this was was lobbyist versus lobbyist and that in this case the internet was aligned, which isn't always the case. Um, when you get Google and Wikipedia working together, that's not every day. Um, and that having the lobbyists come together from the internet versus Hollywood, much as in with CDA uh, in the, the early 1990s, um, the internet had this response that was then able to get other people involved in a more passionate way. Yeah, that's certainly a, a theory that uh, could be made to, to explain what was going on. And I should have pointed out in my talk, I may have skipped over this, uh, the tech companies did spend a lot of lobbying money, which was the import of the questioner's point. The tech companies did spend a lot of money on the other side opposing the bill. Uh, so that certainly, uh, there, were, there was a lot of lobbying money on both sides. The reason I guess I would resist uh, that interpretation of what happened is that a lot of the planning early on 
was not through, led by, let's say, Google or some tech company getting involved, but it was like people getting involved in this internet, non, internet nonprofits, academics, experts getting involved, and sounding the alarm even back in the, the other bill, it was called COICA, uh, back in May of, uh, I think, 2010 uh, or 11. Uh, experts were sounding the alarm, or interest groups were sounding the alarm even back then, and a lot of the protest strategizing, that occurred, I think, not with the big tech corporations driving it, as opposed to these sort of activist internet groups. Obviously, for a, a corporation to get involved in this kind of thing, uh, it, it's a huge decision for them to make, which is a much easier decision for Fight for the Future, which you know, could just say, no, we're going against this. Here's what we should do. Everybody join us. You know, come on and follow us. Uh, so I, I guess I'm a, I'm a little bit resistant to the notion that somehow the lobbying money in the tech sector is what won the debate, uh, tapping into sort of maybe a grassroots movement that was forming. I kind of see it like as the grassroots movement was forming, they came up with these ideas and mushroomed. It was a revere style network. People could join in and do whatever they want, and Google was one of them. So I mean, I see that's the beauty of this decentralized network is that you know, no single authority is in charge. So it's not driven from the top down, it's all bottom up. And that's what, what's made it, I think, in part so it's successful. But, but thank you for that alternative theory. I will definitely uh, consider that as I you know, continue my research. We are sadly out of time, but thanks, Ed, for coming. Thank all of you for coming and for your great questions and participation. Thanks. Thank you.